Vipassana meditation is an ancient technique of truth realization that was rediscovered 25 centuries ago in the land we now call India by the man known as the Buddha. The technique flourished for several centuries after the Buddha's death until the rise of new civilizations all but swept it away. One country where Vipassana survived in its original form was Burma. Nowadays, anyone wishing to learn Vipassana meditation may come to a center like this one in the Blue Mountains, about a two-hour drive west of Sydney. One of the foremost teachers in the Burmese tradition is Mr. S. N. Goenka who left Burma in 1969 and helped reintroduce Vipassana to India and continue its spread to the West. Friends, I am here to explain you in a few words what is this technique of Vipassana meditation and how it helped me and how it keeps on helping thousands of people around the world. In my early 20s, I was a very successful businessman in Burma. And with so much of business activities, I developed a lot of tension in my life. Although I was very successful materially, but I found there was no peace in my life. I hardly could get sound sleep without any sleeping pill. Slowly it developed to a stage where I used to get very severe migraine headaches and all medicines were ineffective. My family doctor started administering morphia injections Every fortnight, I will have a very severe attack of migraine and then a morphia injection is given. It went on for a few years and then this very family doctor became very much worried. He feared that I might become morphia addict. But the best doctors in Burma could not help me to come out of migraine, could not help me to come out of morphia. In those days, I used to travel to different countries in the West for business purposes. My doctor advised me that I better consult some of the best doctors in the West at least to come out of morphia. So I tried a few weeks in Switzerland, a few months in Germany, England, and America, and Japan, but I was unsuccessful. No doctor could take me out of morphia. Taking me out of migraine was far away. I feel myself very fortunate that coming back to my country, I was suggested by a very good friend of mine that I better try a course of 10 days of Vipassana. I met my teacher, who was a householder and a government official. He was the accountant general of Burma, Sayaji Ubakhin. When I met him, and he explained me that this disease is nothing but a psychosomatic disease, and this technique of Vipassana will purify my mind. The tension will go away. And as a result, I might get cured from migraine. But he also warned me that this technique is a high spiritual path to purify the mind and to live a very healthy, 
wholesome life. Curing migraine is just a byproduct of the technique. I was attracted by what all he said. He was a very saintly person. I decided that I should join a camp of 10 days. But then there was some hesitation because I was born in a very staunch conservative Hindu family and here was a teacher from the Buddhist tradition and a technique of Buddhist tradition. I thought I might get converted from my religion to another religion and because of that hesitation was there. But having heard all that my teacher told me about this technique, I understood that this is a very known sectarian technique. I better give a trial. So I went for a 10 day course. Certainly, the first 10 day course itself gave me such a big relief. Not only I was relieved of the migraine, but I found that I am relieved of so much of tension in my life. The great ego in which I was involved because of high position in the society, because of my successful life, this egoism, this started giving me all the tension and it was the main cause of my migraine. And by this technique I found the ego was getting dissolved. I was getting liberated from the tensions and naturally there were no more migrant attacks. As I passed through this technique and I continued to practice it, I found that certainly there is no sectarianism involved in this technique. There is no gurudam, there is no worship of the guru. There is no cult involved. There is no blind belief involved. It is a pure science of mind and matter. How they interact, how they are interrelated, and how by observing one's own mind and one's own body and the interaction between the two, Deep within oneself, one starts understanding how the tensions get built up and one starts understanding how to come out of these tensions. The habit of uh, blind reaction creates a lot of difficulties for us. At the deep unconscious level of the mind, one is a slave of one's own behavior pattern of reacting blindly reacting with craving and clinging whenever one experiences something pleasant and reacting with aversion and hatred whenever one experiences something unpleasant. These blind reactions create so much of tension in the mind, one loses the balance of the mind and one becomes miserable. And one is miserable whenever one is miserable inside one starts distributing this misery to others, one starts making others miserable. This is certainly not a good way of life. And by this technique I found that one learns how to live peacefully and harmoniously within oneself and how to generate nothing but peace and harmony for others. So for me, this is a way of life. This is a code of conduct. This is an art of living how to live peacefully and harmoniously within and how to generate nothing but peace and harmony for others. You may give a trial to this technique, a Christian will continue to remain a Christian, a Jewish will remain a Jewish, a Hindu, a Hindu, a Buddhist, a Buddhist. There is no conversion involved in this technique. One is not getting oneself converted from one organized religion to another organized religion. Of course, conversion is involved. One gets converted from misery to happiness. One gets converted from ignorance to enlightenment. One gets converted from bondage 
to liberation. Give a trial and be happy. Be happy. Be happy. Students who come to a center like this undergo a minimum 10-day course, during which time they live totally within the center. Each meditator is asked to observe five precepts, to abstain from killing, stealing, and lying, and to refrain from all sexual activity and the taking of intoxicants. The courses are run on a donation basis. After completing a 10-day course, one is free to give whatever one is inspired to by what one has experienced. The Buddha said, we are shaped by our thoughts. We become what we think. When the mind is pure, Joy follows like a shadow that never leaves. A very good sunny Indian morning to you all. <laughs> you have all assembled here in this meditation center to understand what is being practiced here, what is being taught here. The word meditation carries different meanings for different people because there are different types of meditations. One common meaning which people understand about meditation is that you try to concentrate your mind, fixing it on some object or the other and mostly imaginary object. You close your eyes and you try to imagine the shape or the form of this god or that goddess, this saintly person or that saintly person. The mind wanders away and again you bring it back. It wanders away, you bring it back. And like this, you try to concentrate your mind. Another way is that you start repeating some words. Any word, the name of this god or that goddess, this saintly person or that saintly person, in whom you have got great devotion. You keep on repeating this word mentally, the mind wanders, and again you start repeating, the mind wanders, again you start repeating, and this is how you try to concentrate your mind. Or you just start giving some suggestion to the mind, some auto-suggestion, and like this you try to concentrate your mind. Or you just contemplate, just think of, some good things, good sermon, 
of a saintly person, a portion of the scripture in which you have got great faith. Like this, there are many kinds of meditations with different objects. But here, whatever is taught is totally different. Of course, my concentration of the mind is helpful, no doubt, but that is like a means, not the end. The purpose of the meditation, which is taught here, and it is called Vipassana, a ancient language of India, the Pali language, the word vipassana means to observe and to observe the reality as it is, not just as it seems to be, not just as it appears to be, but as it is, in its true nature, in its true characteristic, so that you come out of the illusion or delusion or confusion about the reality. Reality pertaining to what? Reality pertaining to your own self. This is the biggest delusion. One does not know who I am, or rather what I am. All the saints and sages of the past have been telling us, know thyself, know thyself, but how to know thyself? There must be a way, there must be a technique. Just by listening to such discourses or reading scriptures or merely trying to understand it at the intellectual level does not help us to know ourselves. We have to explore the entire field <coughs> entire field of the so-called I. What is this I? Is this physical structure I? At the intellectual level you will say, no, the body is not I. I am not this body. But at the actual level, when you are actually dealing in the life, day-to-day -day life, the body has become I tremendous amount of identification with this body and tremendous amount of attachment towards this body resulting in tremendous amount of tension, misery. After all, what is this body? To which I keep on saying, I, I, mine, mine. And similarly, what is this mind? Is this mind I? Is this mind mine? Can I say this mind as myself? What is this mind? Again, not merely trying to understand what is this body, what is this mind, but to experience it. The whole technique is an analytical study of this mental and material structure at the experiential level. Of course, intellect will be there, intellect will try to understand, but not depending merely on intellect. You are to explore the reality by your own experience, a analytical study of mind and matter within the framework of this body, the mind and matter, how they are working, how one keeps on influencing the other how one keeps on getting influenced by the other, there is a constant interaction going on between mind and matter, constant interaction. When you go deep inside, you start understanding what is this interaction which is going on inside. So it is an analytical study of your own structure, mind and matter exploring it, exploring it from the surface level, the apparent truth about the mind, the apparent truth about the matter, 
and then going deeper, deeper, deeper within yourself, within this body structure, going deeper, 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 you start experiencing truths which are subtler, 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 till you reach the stage where you can experience the subtlest truth, truth, the subtlest truth pertaining to the matter. The subtlest truth pertaining to the matter is the subatomic particle. The apparent truth of the body is, it seems to be so solid, and of course, at the apparent level, it is so solid. But as you go deeper and deeper with your own experience, you will find that there is no solidity at all. The entire physical structure is just mass of subatomic particles which keep on arising, passing, arising, passing with great rapidity. The entire structure is nothing but wavelets, wavelets, wavelets. This is what the modern scientists have found out, not by their experience, but by their intellect, by various scientific apparatus that they use. And this is what was found out by the enlightened persons of the past who explored the reality within themselves at the experiential level. No other instrument was involved. With their own experience, they went deeper, deeper, deeper. And they came to this realization that the apparent looking solid body is actually nothing but tiny little bubbles, tiny little wavelets arising, passing, arising, passing with great rapidity. This is the ultimate truth pertaining to the matter. Similarly, exploring the truth pertaining to the mind, initially one comes across very solidified, intensified mind and mental contents. Like say, anger as a reason. It is so intense and it always tries to overpower you or passion as a reason, or fear as a reason. Anything that arises in the mind tries to overpower you. You start observing that this is the apparent reality, the gross reality of the matter and the contents of the matter. And as you keep on observing, 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 you will reach the stage where the mind also and the mental contents are also nothing but wavelets, 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 very tiny little wavelets arising, passing, arising, passing with great rapidity. This is what the students start experiencing as they make an exploration of the truth pertaining to mind and matter. And as they keep on moving further, further, deeper, deeper, they reach a stage which is beyond mind and matter. Just to see what is this I, to which I keep on saying I, 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 after all, what is this I? And all this process, all this exercise is not just for the sake of curiosity. The exercise keeps on changing the present habit pattern of your mind. The present habit pattern of the mind is that you keep on reacting. You come across anything pleasant, you react with craving, you react with clinging. You come across anything unpleasant, you react with aversion, you react with hatred. And every time you react, either you react with craving or clinging, or you react with aversion or hatred, you will note that you have lost the balance of your mind and you have started generating tension within you. You have started tying knots within you and knots after knots, knots after knots. As you go deeper inside, you will find that the entire mind matter structure that you are carrying now is full of knots, knots, gorgeous knots, which keep you so tense. At the surface level, one try to come, tries to come out of the tension by keeping oneself engaged in this sensual pleasure or that sensual pleasure. One feels, I am quite happy. I got no misery. I got no tension now. But as you go deep inside, you will find that you are a bundle of tension. 
And that is why the life is so miserable. There is no real happiness in the life. If this tension from the depth of the mind goes away, then you will find that the happiness that you experience is something inexplainable. You can't express it in words. You can't compare it with any happiness that you might have experienced at the sensual level. It is so peaceful. It is so pleasant. But that happens only when the mind is liberated from the tensions, from the knots, from the defilements of anger, hatred, ill will, animosity, passion, fear, ego. All these impurities, defilements, make one so unhappy. Mere sermons does not help. Mere intellectualization and understanding at the intellectual level, oh, I should not generate anger. This is not good for me. I should not generate fear. I should not generate ego. But yet one keeps on generating. Understanding fully well that when I generate anger, I become very miserable. I make myself miserable. I make others miserable. Every time I generate anger, I make myself miserable, I make others miserable. So I should not generate anger. And yet, anything unwanted has happened in the life, one reacts with anger. Because the intellect part of the mind, what is called the conscious level of the mind, is so small. The other part is so big, the half-conscious or unconscious. And this half-conscious or unconscious, the so-called half-conscious, unconscious, it is very conscious inside, in its own way. This half-conscious or unconscious mind constantly keeps on reacting, either with craving or with aversion, either with craving or with aversion. And it has, it has become a slave of its own habit pattern. And that is why one remains so much agitated deep inside. Now, this technique helps people to go inside and observe it and as you observe it, you start coming out of your blind reaction, your habit of blind reaction, and the life starts changing. As you get more and more established in this technique of self-exploration, the truth of, about your own mind and matter, the reaction taking place between mind and matter, more and more you observe it, observe it, you find the reaction is becoming less, 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 your mind is now more calm, more quiet, and you can face the world much better. Because when you live the life in the world, and you have to live the life in the world, you come here for 10 days, this is like a hospital. A sick person goes to the hospital to regain the health, not to live there for the whole life. You regain your health and make use of this health in your day-to-day -day life. So here you come, to explore this reality within yourself and come out of the misery which is because of your mental tension. And once you have come out of it, even to some extent, now you make use of it in your day-to-day -day life. And then whatever you learn here, you try to practice every day. Like you learn a physical exercise and you practice daily this physical exercise to keep your body healthy, to keep your body strong. Similarly, it is a mental exercise. One comes here, learns for 10 days this mental exercise and practices morning and evening to remain healthy at the mental level and make use of this healthy mind to live a good life. Whenever our mind is unhealthy, whenever one is agitated inside, whenever one is irritated inside, one keeps on living the life of negativity because one keeps on li living the life of reac reaction. Reaction is always full of negativity. If one comes out of the habit of living the life of reaction and starts living the life of action, wonderful, action is always positive. Reaction full of negativity is always harmful for oneself and harmful for others. A life of action which is positive is good for oneself and good for others. That is why the whole technique is nothing but an art of living. How to live peacefully, how to live harmoniously.
generating peace and harmony within and giving this peace and harmony vibration to the atmosphere around so that people who come in contact with us can also experience some peace and harmony. When there is no harmony in my mind, when there is no peace in my mind, my mind is very agitated, this is what I contribute to the atmosphere around me. I make the entire atmosphere around me agitated. And anyone comes in contact with this atmosphere, feels agitation, cannot feel, feel peace, cannot feel harmony. So the whole technique is nothing but a way of life, a code of conduct, how to live properly without harming oneself and without harming others, maintaining the peace and harmony of oneself and maintaining the peace and harmony of the atmosphere around us. Now a few words about the technique, what people do here, how they practice. One thing very important is that uh, you have to explore the field of your own reality inside this mind-matter phenomena, the entire field of mind-matter phenomena, which is a delicate job. It is so difficult to explore something so deeper. So you require a very quiet atmosphere around you. If there is a lot of disturbance all around, it is so difficult for the mind to become concentrated and work inside. That is one reason that in this type of meditation center, when a course is going on, outsiders are not allowed. Not that outsiders are untouchable and they should not come, nothing like that. But to avoid all kinds of disturbances, the peace and tranquility of the area is necessary to be maintained. And then one starts exploring oneself. What is this physical structure? What is this mental structure? One is asked to sit down, sit down quietly, close your eyes, keep your mouth closed. Now there is no physical activity. There is no vocal activity. Now let me see what is happening in this body. And the first thing that you will come across is a flow of respiration. Naturally, the breath comes in, the breath goes out, the breath comes in, the breath goes out. This is the grossest reality that you will come across as you start working. Well, you start with that. You just start observing your breath, the breath coming in, the breath going out. Don't make it a breathing exercise. You are not supposed to regulate your breath. You are not supposed to control your breath. There are many other techniques where the controlling of the breath is helpful. But here, you are not supposed to control. Just observe the breath. If it is deep, you are aware it is deep. If it is shallow, you are just aware it is shallow. If it is passing through this nostril, you are just aware passing through this nostril or passing through that nostril or passing through both the nostrils. You are developing your faculty of awareness, mindfulness mindfulness of the truth pertaining to your own mind and matter. As you proceed, of course, when you work, there are so many difficulties. Because of the old habit, the mind starts wandering here, there, but very patiently you keep on working. Very soon you will understand that this breath is not merely a physical function. It has something to do with the mind also. You will notice that while you are observing your breath, a thought of the past might come, a thought of the future might come, and because of that you may generate some negativity, some anger or hatred or ill will. And as soon as you generate any negativity, you notice that your breath is no more normal. It has become slightly hard, slightly fast. And when that negativity has gone away, you will notice the breath is again normal. Oh, so the breath is not only a physical function, it has something to do with the mind and something to do with the mental impurities also. And you proceed further. Within the time, by the time you reach the fourth day, you find that there are sensations throughout the body, either heat or cold or itching or tingling or throbbing or pulsing or weight or heaviness or lightness. Something is happening throughout the body. Throughout the body, there is constantly something happening, some biochemical reaction or the other constantly happening. 
some electromagnetic reaction or the other constantly happening but our mind remains so scattered at the surface level it does not want to observe the reality within ourselves so whatever is happening the conscious mind does not remain aware of it now this technique helps you to go deeper 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 and you start feeling sensations throughout the body by the time one reaches the sixth day seventh day eighth day it depends not that everyone quite a few students reach the stage where they find that the entire structure is nothing but vibrations vibrations nothing but vibrations mind or matter nothing but vibrations arising passing arising it is to be experienced not merely to be accepted accepted at the intellectual level or devotional level that doesn't help one has to experience it and one starts experiencing look there is no solidity no where there is any solidity and then one goes deeper to understand the interaction which is going on between mind and matter one comes to the eye sense door vibration vibration ear sense door vibration vibration nose sense door vibration vibration tongue sense door vibration vibration the skin sense door vibration vibration the mind sense door vibration vibration these are the only six sense doors through which we come in contact with the entire world outside it is nothing but vibration vibration and whatever comes in contact with this sense doors that is also vibration vibration a sound has come in contact one notices there is vibration vibration a shape or form or color or light has come in contact with the eyes it is vibration a smell has come in contact with the nose it is vibration a taste has come in contact with the tongue it is vibration something tangible has come in contact with the body it is vibration a thought has come in contact with the mind vibration vibration everything is just vibration vibration all right a sound has come in contact with the ear a vibration has come in contact with the vibration and because of this contact a new type of vibration starts another type of vibration starts like you strike a gong and where you strike a gong a vibration starts there but this vibration does not remain limited to the area where you struck the gong the entire gong starts vibrating so your entire physical structure will start vibrating when you hear a sound or you see a, a, a view anything or you smell something or you taste something or you touch something or you think something vibrations everywhere one part of the mind will say oh something has happened a sound has come something has happened at the ear sense door then immediately another part of the mind will say what has happened some words what words words of abuse or words of praise this is the second part of the mind its job is to recognize and then to give valuation the words of abuse oh very bad the words of praise ah wonderful it has given evaluation to it and immediately the third part of the mind starts working these very sensations these very vibrations which were very neutral now when you are given evaluation this is abused very bad you will notice all this vibration turn into very unpleasant very unpleasant vibrations and when the evaluation is given oh these words are words of praise ah wonderful and you will find that these vibrations have become very pleasant vibration the third part of the mind starts feeling these vibrations pleasant unpleasant or neutral and then immediately the fourth part of the mind starts reacting if it is pleasant it starts reacting with craving if it is unpleasant it starts reacting with aversion and this process keeps on multiplying multiplying continues 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 for a long time and makes you unbalanced for longer period the mind loses its peace loses its harmony if you just observe it oh after all word is word vibration is vibration look it is arising passing arising passing you try to keep your mind calm quiet you try to keep your mind balanced you try to keep your mind equanimous without reacting and this is how you started changing the habit pattern of your mind understanding the entire process of mind and matter the interaction of mind and matter and how without knowing it we keep on multiplying our tensions we keep on multiplying our misery and by understanding it every action
actual level, at the experiential level, we are coming out of our mad habit of reaction, which makes us so miserable. Of course, not that in 10 days one changes the entire habit pattern, but in 10 days one gets a glimpse as to what is happening within me. What is happening in the structure of mind or matter, which I keep on saying, I, I, my, my, what is happening? And without my knowing all about it at the actual level, at the experiential level, look, one has become a slave of this habit pattern of reaction. One has become a slave of the tension, of the misery that one keeps on generating every moment and one keeps on multiplying every moment. If this habit pattern starts changing even little bit, one is coming out of misery, little by little. And as this habit pattern changes more and more, more and more, one finds that one is coming out of the misery more and more, more and more, and this habit pattern is totally changed. One is totally liberated from misery. It is nothing but a pure science of mind and matter, a applied science, to understand the process of mind and matter, how it works, not just by reading books, not just by listening to discourses, but it is the applied science. You have to understand it within this laboratory of your own mind and matter inside as to what is happening, how things are happening, how mind is getting affected by the matter, how the matter is getting affected by the mind, how this interaction is going on, how this cross current is going on, undercurrent is going on, constantly something or the other is happening throughout the structure and understanding it, understanding it you start coming out of your old habit pattern which keeps you very miserable. This is a universal way to come out of the universal misery. Reacting with anger or hatred or ill will or passion, craving. This is the habit of everyone. This mad habit is not only limited to the Christians or to the Muslims or to the Hindus or to the Buddhists or to the Jewish. It is not merely limited to the Australians or New Zealanders or English or Russians or Chinese. It is universal. This malady is universal. We keep on reacting with these negativities and we keep on becoming miserable. The remedy is also universal. This is not something which will convert you from your organized religion to some other organized religion. This technique has nothing to do with the organized religions. Like you go to a school, a college, and you understand some, something about the science, and then applied science, you are not getting yourself converted from one religion to another religion. Similarly, you are understanding the science of your own mind and matter, the applied science. By your own experience, you are understanding it, you are not converting yourself from one religion to another religion. Of course, you are converting yourself. Conversion is involved. You are converting yourself from misery to happiness, from ignorance to wisdom. This conversion is involved. And everyone needs this conversion. Now, because the technique is quite new to many places, people are a bit apprehensive about it. What is going on? Is it some foreign cult which is coming in our country? Some foreign dogma? Some foreign belief? Some foreign religion which is be being imposed on us? A pure science. Once people pass through it, they understand it is a pure science. I foresee the future. As you are having schools and colleges in every part of your country, from the most populated cities to less populated villages. Everywhere there are schools, colleges, hospitals. Similarly, a time will come when you will have such meditation centers throughout the country, throughout the world, because people need it. They want something to know about their own mind and matter. You may read books of psychology to learn about mind. That won't help you. You read so many books about physiology about anatomy of your body, doesn't help you. But you experience the truth about your own mind and matter that starts helping you to take you out of your old habit pattern where you generate negativities, you become miserable, you harm yourself, you harm others, and you learn a technique by which 
you can enjoy real peace, real harmony, real happiness. May all of you who have come to listen this Dhamma talk today, this talk about the mind and matter, the law of nature, may find time and spare ten days of your life and experience it. Only by experience you will know what it is. Mere talks won't help. Experience it not to oblige anybody, for your own good, for your own benefit, for your own real happiness. May all of you enjoy real peace, real harmony, real happiness. Real happiness to you all, real peace to you all, real harmony to you all. already here. Good. Good, 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 good. That will save time. <coughs> Shouldn't we use our time trying to eradicate injustice and poverty in society rather than sitting introspectively meditating? Isn't this selfish? Very good question. Why should you run away from your responsibilities of the life and come here and try to enjoy peace inside, this is really selfish if it is so. No, you are not coming here for that purpose. You are coming here for the purpose to live a life in the society. You are to fight out all the injustice everywhere that is going on. You are to help the society to come out of all kinds of agitations, all kinds of injustices. But how can you do that? Unless you have that strength within you, the mental strength that is needed, the moral strength that is needed, if you yourself is uh, highly agitated inside, you can't bring peace outside. A lame person cannot help another lame person. A blind person cannot guide another blind person. So what you do here is to get the strength to serve the society, to serve yourself and serve the society. It is not running away from the responsibilities of the life. What causes you to, to become interested in meditation? What causes you to first become interested? Yes. The first cause is that you come here to listen and then you use your intellect. What this guy is talking, is it rational, is it pragmatic, is there some sense in it or is just talking nonsense? If there is some sense in it, then let me try. And this is how people come and they try. And by trying they find, oh, it is wonderful, it is good, it is scientific, it is logical, it is rational. No dogma is involved, no cult is involved, no foreign religion is involved. It is pure science, nothing but science. Do you practice long hours of meditation each day? Not necessary. The each day the life becomes a life of meditation. This meditation is meditation of awareness. You are aware of everything that you are doing. Everything that is happening outside and you are aware simultaneously everything that is happening inside. So you live a life of awareness. But for that, morning and evening of course, you have to sit for some time. Like exercise that you have learned somewhere, Unless you practice it daily, it won't give you the fruits. If you learn a physical exercise, if you don't practice every day, then this physical exercise will not give you any fruits. You'll learn somewhere, but you're not making use of it. It is to be practiced every day and used in the life. 
when doing meditation on the breath in and out at the nose area, do we use the mind to concentrate at the nose area or use the mind and eyes together to concentrate on the nose area? Eyes are to be kept closed, no function of the eyes. And the mind tries to be aware of the respiration, the breath coming in, going out, but because of its old habit, it keeps on wandering away. It wanders, and as soon as you realize it has wandered away, smiling, you bring back. And again, you start observing it. Again, after some time, you find it has wandered away. Again, smilingly bring it back. Don't generate anger towards your wandering mind. You have to come out of your habit of anger, and by practicing this technique, don't multiply this habit of anger. Just observe. If it has wandered away, this is the reality of this moment. Look, my mind has wandered away. All right, the, the breath is still there. Let me try. And you try again. How does Vipassana relate to the concept of evolution? Every moment evolution is taking place, but evolution should be a healthy evolution. And Vipassana helps you for, with this healthy evolution. Is there anything written on the work in India with prisoners and police? Yes. Good research was done in India as to how this technique helps very hard criminals in the prison and the police officials who have got such a big responsibility to keep peace and harmony in the society, law and justice in the society, so they remain very tense because of their heavy duties. So big research was made by different departments of the government from uni by universities, some committees were established and those committees they looked into the meditators when the course was given in the jail or in the police academy at the beginning, during the course, after the course, and continued to examine them up to six months or one year after the course, and they found wonderful results. And there are records available for that. How can you concentrate on the speaker and think of a question? Don't think of a question while you are... <laughs> Otherwise, you won't listen. <laughs> After you have listened, then think. No, 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 simultaneously. <laughs> uh, why do you not permit mantra or visualization in your technique? Well, it is not my technique, it is Vipassana technique. Because when you have mantra, you are creating a vibration. Every time you recite any word mentally, and continuously the same word, you keep on repeating the same word mentally, then you are generating a vibration and your entire being, mind and matter will get engulfed with this created vibration, artificial vibration. And this will not allow you to see your own vibration, natural vibration. You have to see what vibration you get when you generate anger, when you generate passion, when you generate fear, what kind of vibration is there. And that is how you have to observe that reality of your mind at the deepest level. If you Engulf yourself with a created vibration, you can't go to that depth. And similarly with visualization, if you just want to concentrate your mind, then yes, a imaginary vision is very good for you. It will get concentrated. But you will miss those vibrations which are there in your body, the vibrations of different kinds of mental contents, and they are very important for you. In having, is having a guru a barrier to progress and enlightenment? Certainly. A very big hindrance. Gurudam is big danger. That is why in this technique there is no such thing as gurudam. You are not supposed to live under the clutches of a guru. Don't allow anybody to exploit you in the name of gurudam. Here somebody is just a guide. He has walked on the path and says, this is how I walked on the path and I got this benefit. You also try. You will get benefit only if you walk on the path. Guru cannot do anything. If you depend on the guru that my guru will liberate me, my guru will enlighten me, then it is a big hindrance, certainly it is a very big hindrance. Why does Mrs. Goenka wear a Hindu forehead mark if this is a Buddhist method? Oh, this is neither a Buddhist method, <laughs> nor it is a Hindu mark. <laughs> she feels happy that way, and I feel seeing her happy that way. This is the way of life. <laughs> What Hindu about it? What Buddhist about it? <laughs> I heard of different techniques, different teachings regarding Vipassana. How they all, are they all related, related to 
different streams of vipassana. Yes, sometimes confusion comes because people hear about different kinds of uh, vipassana techniques being taught at different schools. Don't get confused. It is just the difference is how you start. Somebody's mind is very gross, very gross, and can't feel the breath, can't feel the breath coming in at the entrance of the nostrils. Well, such a mind is asked to keep your hand on the stomach, and as you breathe in, it arises. You breathe out, it falls. You keep on, keep on feeling your abdomen. It, it starts that way, but ultimately you have to go to the same stations, you have to experience the same things. Similarly, as you are walking, you start by just observing, oh, I am walking, I am eating, but ultimately you have to come to the stage where while walking you are aware of your sensations, while eating you are aware of your sensations. So there is no basic difference, starting point differs, that's all. Can sitting for long periods of time in the same position cause injury to the body? Why sit in the same position? You could change your position. Sit comfortably. Only at a stage where you feel that, yes, let me try. Let me try, but not more than an hour. Don't go to extremes. And that sitting for one hour is only when you are in the course here, going back home when you practice. Don't go to this extreme that I won't change my posture even for one hour. When you feel like changing, change it. But you are aware, I am changing now. Look, there is a pressure now. Look, there is a pain here. And I am changing my posture to come out of this pain. Yes, I am changing. You are aware. You are mindful. That's all. Good enough. Shouldn't we use... Oh, this is over. Any, anything else? <laughs> oh, big... <laughs> good. Good, good. It will keep me busy for some time. Good. <laughs> Can meditation be a physically painful experience? No. Pains are there. You just want to run away from your pains. The life is full of pain. This physical body, full of pains. You just want to divert your attention to something to forget this pain. This technique teaches you to not to run away from it, observe it. Learn how to observe it so that this pain does not overpower you. During the process of detachment, watching, not reacting, one sees a lot of things. Sometimes it, it gets so strong, especially towards a parent or relative who you want to respect, but it gets very hard. Do you still keep watching and say something about, about the, this impression? Yes. Why these negativities keep coming up on the surface? Your strong negativity towards your parent or towards your uh, friend, uh, your relation, this or that, this is nothing but the accumulation of your own garbage. You are so much accumulated inside and this technique makes a deep surgical operation of your mind. When you cut open the wound, the pus is bound to come on the surface. You can't expect rose water to come out of it. You have got all this pus inside, negativity, negativity, let it come. It comes on the surface, passes away, it comes on the surface, passes away, you are relieved from it. Good, allow it to come. And keep on observing your respiration and your sensation. What is the positive value when not meditating of examining one's sankharas with perseverance? Yes. If you just keep on examining how your mind is working, the sankhara means the reaction of the mind, it helps. But it helps only at the certain level of the mind. The conscious mind, what you call your intellect, will be purified by this. You keep on observing how your mind is working, look what thought is coming, now look negativity as a reason, now aversion towards somebody as a reason, then you observe it, and observing, observing, you come out of it, wonderful. But deep inside, the so-called unconscious mind is not touched by that. If you start working with the sensation, then you are working with the deepest level of your mind and you start purifying the deepest level of the mind. And this vipassana, this is what it does. It takes you to the deepest level of your mind to allow you to purify your mind at the deepest level. What of the spirit? Does God exist? <laughs> If the God exists, he will be so pleased seeing people practicing vipassana. 
and living a good life, a moral life, without harming anybody, without generating any negativity in the mind. They are living according to the law of nature which I have created. And these people are low-abiding citizens of the world. They'll be very happy. Let the God be there. Why worry? <laughs> and if there is a soul inside, this soul will be very much helped. A soul full of negativities will be a miserable soul. Allow this negativity to go away and let the soul be there. It will be very happy. Why worry yourself about this soul and God? Your problem is that you keep on tying knots, tying knots. You become a bundle of misery. You become so miserable in life. You harm yourself. You harm others. Come out of this misery. This is more important than these philosophical questions. Is it possible to meditate while nursing a baby? Certainly. Certainly. You are just aware what is happening and you are aware of your sensation. And the baby who gets the food gets with wonderful vibrations of dhamma, of, of meditation. And a good nursing is being done. Could we start making arrangements for a Vipassana school and for a child care center so that mothers can sit courses? Certainly a time will come. Now it is just beginning. Later on, as it de develops, such things are bound to happen. When should parents start teaching meditation to their children? Before the birth. A pregnant mother should start teaching the child inside. When you meditate, the child inside gets that vibration of purity and it comes out a dhamma baby, a very peaceful child. How can you not react or meditate your way out of grief caused by the death of a child? This is what Vipassana will teach. A very near or dear one has passed away and you start crying and you keep on crying, crying, crying. That dear or dear one is not going to come back. Whatever is disassociated is disassociated forever. And you are unnecessarily making yourself so miserable. Not only yourself miserable, you make the entire atmosphere around you miserable. Anybody in the family, when you are so very much crying, other members of the family also become so sad. Instead of that, the sadness has come because some very dear one has passed away. You just accept the fact the dear one has passed away. And look, there is grief in my mind. Let me see. Let me see what sensations are there on the body along with it. And you start observing the sensation, sensation, anicca, this is impermanent, this is impermanent. Look, it arises, it passes away. It arises, it passes away. And you find you are coming out of grief. There is no meaning in crying. It doesn't help in any way. And this does not suppress your grief. It will allow it to come up and pass away. Could Mr. Goinka comment on conditions in Burma? <laughs> I'm going to Burma now. And let me see. <laughs> Burma or any country, human being is human being, a bundle of misery. <laughs> when they keep on generating negativities, they are miserable. Whether they live in Burma or they live in any, anywhere else, it makes no difference. After each one hour sitting, we are to give five minutes for mitta. If upon examination we find that there is unpleasant, gross sensations, is it permissible to do the mitta meditation lying down, or should we wait until there is no pain? Yes, lie down. When you lie down, the pain is gone. Then practice mitta. Hmm. Is the overall objective of vipassana one's own self-enlightenment? Certainly. First, you enlighten yourself, then you can enlighten others. If there is darkness all around, at least one candle is lighted. And that starts giving some light around. And with one, it will become two, it will become three, and the darkness will get, get away. This is how one has to work. First, one has to help oneself, and then one will start helping others also. Is it advisable to do a Vipassana course for somebody who wants to stop drinking or to get, get off drugs. No, no, you can't meditate for somebody else. You can work out your own salvation, your own liberation. If you are addicted to alcohol and if you practice, certainly you will come out of the addiction. If you are addicted to the drugs and you practice, you will come out of this addiction. 
If you are addicted to your anger, to your passion, to your fear, to your ego, you will certainly come out of it. But you will meditate and somebody else will come out. That is not possible. If you are thirsty, you drink water and your thirst is gone. If somebody else is thirsty and you drink water, his thirst cannot go. He has to drink water himself, herself. So it is to be practiced by everyone. But when you practice, you can encourage others with your own experience. You can say, well, this has helped me. Why not you also try? What is the role of the teacher? <laughs> the role of the teacher is to teach. That's all. One has walked over that path, and one says, I have walked over this path, and this is how I have walked. This is how I have taken steps. You also try. Try, and see what happens. If you find it is good, you accept it. Otherwise, don't, don't accept it. That's all. This is the role of the teacher, nothing more. Good. Be happy. <laughs> be happy, be happy. Let us hope some of you will find time. several people who are taking a 10-day course of Vipassana meditation for the first time. I just heard that it was, a, well, what my friend told me, it's a 10-day retreat, no talking, and that's really all I heard, just meditating for 10 days, not talking. Our son Harry has been to a course here, and that's how we heard of it, and uh, Harry felt that it might be beneficial to both my wife and myself, psychologically. I heard about it through a friend who had another friend who sent some books to her and she offered to loan me the books and I read the books and was very impressed and thought this is for me. I've been feeling for the last couple of years that I'm going through a change and that I need to go through a change and that some really quite big major change is sort of coming up or I'm in the throes of it, which is making life as unbearable as it is. And um, I said, you know, like, I really needed to clear my mind. And he said, the passive med meditation, you see. I thought, there it is again, that word, you know, again. And um, so that's when I, I wrote off for the, for the info. And uh, it came back and I noticed that, that um, Goenka was taking this course uh, which wasn't too far in the future, and I thought, I'll, I'll wait for that one, so I applied, and here I am. It's just really nice to get out of Sydney, and um, it was lovely getting off the train and realising half the people on the train are actually coming as well, so... And just to look around at the diversity of the people, and to know that, you know, some have done it, and some haven't done it, and it's just great to see that there's so many people that are into this technique or are interested in trying it out. Well, what uh, my wife and I observed was the, uh, the wide uh, range of areas that uh, the students have come from, if you call them students in the course. We noticed just alongside our vehicle were a Queensland number plate. There was a Canberra, a Tasmanian, a Victorian and a South Australian number plate all alongside. So it's obvious people have come from everywhere. So. Uh, we're sort of uh, looking forward to uh, positive results from uh, being here. Even though when I first was intimidated about the 10 days of silence, I thought that would be good to be with yourself for 10 days and to be out in the mountains, um, away from the city, that really appealed to me. Um, and to learn a meditation technique, basically, because the only thing I've... I mean, I've done creative visualisation, that's basically... I haven't been... Like, I think... We've had, Somebody told me that it's to do with breath and your body and so. Uh, 12 years ago, I did TM and uh, I practiced it, I think, for about six months and then it went. I've done it in my own sort of way. I've been swimming for the last 10 years and I, I sort of use that like a, a way of centering myself, of meditating. And I'm interested in, in trying this technique just as a way of, of um, just clearing a lot of things, just 
getting back to or getting more in touch with, with my essence? Oh, I just make a better person out of myself, yeah, you know, mentally, physically, whatever, you know, the whole lot. Yeah, spiritually, I'm looking forward to it. The, the other experience with, uh, the, with meditation was um, something I couldn't quite come to grips with because it had a lot of religious sort of overtones and, and there were a lot of rituals and stuff, um, which reminded me very much of my Catholic upbringing, which I'd rejected. And uh, I think that was all getting in the way, you know. And when I read about this and read the literature on this, it, it just seems much cleaner, um, much more, less cluttered and um, less confused with like religious overtones and gods and pictures of people on velvet chairs that you have to bow down in front of and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> I think the fact that it was the insight meditation, it wasn't just sitting chanting in your mind a mantra and having a nothingness, but it was an actual um, learning process and to me that just seemed a better way to go. The only expectation I have is for me is maybe just to be more calm within myself and be able to make some decisions about my life and where it's going and what, I, what I've been pushing down, I think emotions and everything like that. To have less fear and anger, I think, or at least to be able to confront that and look at it and um, work my way through it. I've come a couple of thousand k's to do it, so, you know, I can't really jump back now. You know, I'm here, so I've got to, I've got to do it. Yeah. Despite the picturesque surroundings, a Vipassana course is by no means a holiday camp. It is an intensive and serious process that yields results only by diligently following the rules of the center and the guidance of the teacher. Although students observe a vow of silence for most of the 10 days, if they need to, they can speak privately to the teacher or to their assistants. In the first part of the course, students focus and calm the mind by observing their natural breath. This heightened awareness is then used to penetrate to the deeper levels of the unconscious mind. This begins the process of mental and physical purification. This is called Vipassana. Much of the day is devoted to meditation, but during meal breaks and rest periods, students are free to exercise, attend to personal needs, or just relax. At the end of the 10-day course, we spoke to the same students about their experience. You know, the silence is uh, something that isn't hard to take as far as I'm concerned. The rest of the voice has been a little bit of a problem getting the voice going again after 10 days of, uh, of complete rest. I realised how conditioned I was to speak to people and to communicate with people, even like even just sitting down at breakfast and you wanted to talk to somebody and you couldn't. And I found the, ten, the, the silence really hard for the first about four or five days and then all of a sudden it was fine. It was bliss. <laughs> it was quite strict, but I think it needed to be. I mean, I think me personally, I needed, I needed a kick because there's a battle going on. Part of me was saying that this is, this is great, this is great. I want to go to India and do a 30 day retreat. And the other part was saying, are you crazy? What are you doing here? You know, this is, this is hard. This is, I must be out of my mind. But I mean, there, I knew there'd be a battle before I came here. So the longer I was here, I just learned to um, just observe that and think, well, okay, look, I'm going through this. That's okay. We'll just watch it. Day one, I wanted to go. You know, I, I had serious reservations about the, <laughs> the wisdom of doing this. And I thought, I did, I had heard stories about people going mad and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> and I thought this could happen, I suppose, in my present mental condition. And, uh, and, then, and then day three was blissful. It was like, oh, this is wonderful. You know, I really felt probably happier than I've felt for many years on that day, all day. It was just sort of like a um, blissed out thing. And of course, looking back on it, I, I fell into the, <laughs> the trap of craving. <laughs> I had a girl say to me this morning, 
When you came up here, she said, you were so drawn and so lined. I thought, was I? I didn't know. <laughs> I realised how, how caught I, how much I was caught up in my own little world of um, all the, how do you say, the egocentric and the self-centred um, things. And trying to make myself happy just for myself and not being able to... I mean, I was giving to other people, but not expecting something in return. So in that way, I think it'll benefit me as well, be able to give to other people without expecting anything. I think it's, uh, it's something that will reinforce my previous feelings and uh, probably give me incentive to... Uh, to try, to try and communicate harmony and peace to the world, which is, after all, what we're all aiming at, isn't it? It's given me a better idea of where, how and why we stand in the scheme of things, and it's brightened my, my horizons, more or less. <laughs> just instead of having such a narrow point of view, you know, it's just, you know, it's everything, so it's all out there, you know, it's so big, it's just brilliant there. <laughs> I think I'm a bit more open and a bit more uh, um, compassionate. Not quite as um, sort of locked into myself, maybe, you know. It's sort of a bit of a, been a bit of an opening, I think. I have. I feel I now have a tool for expanding my awareness. Uh, of where I'm headed in this life. Um, it's the first time, and I've been looking for a long time, I've been looking maybe for 30 years, and I've done a lot of reading, um, knowing, always knowing there was something else. But this is the very first time that I've actually been able to find something that tells you how to do it. Um, all the other things I've read are, are similar in terms of what you should try to achieve and things like that. And none of it ever told you how. And this tells you how. The thing I really like about um, this technique is um, it's non-sectarian. I I've, I've felt the older I've got, I didn't feel religious, I don't feel religious, but I'm feeling more and more spiritually inclined, I guess you'd say. And for me, this is a way to to develop that without becoming a, a member of a certain sect. <laughs> but I found there was a great deal of sort of support, very quiet sort of support and compassionate support sort of lurking in the wings, you know. And that, that was reassuring. I mixed in well with all the others there. Everyone's so easygoing and cooperative. Yeah. I think it's well run. I think it's wonderful that the people that meditate here come back and give service. Um, and become part of it because it just keeps the feeling of everything very much alive and um, yeah, everything just seems to fall into place. I realise now to concentrate on making myself happy then other people will be happy around me. So, and if I'm more peaceful within myself then I will be more peaceful. I had a, a real need to, to find some sort of clarity and simplicity in my life and I feel this technique, I mean, it's given me a lot of time or just being here and, and not speaking for 10 days to, to go over what I'm doing with my life. And nothing feels wrong at the moment. I mean, I feel like I'm going in the right direction. I think this technique will help me to, to get clear about it, though, and, and hopefully will open up opportunities for me to, to um, practice what I believe. I'm very glad I did it. Yeah, very glad. First step's always the hardest in anything you want to do, but you know, once you make that step, it's always easy. You know, like I do a lot of work and with the type of work, you know, the first step's always the hardest. Like gold mining, dredging, you know, the first ounce is always the hardest to get, but once you get it, you're away, you know. The passion of meditation is taught by Mr. S. N. Goenka avoids all rituals, chanting and guru worship and is open to people of any religious persuasion. There is no charge for taking a course. The centre and the courses are funded solely by student donations and new students are free to contribute only after completing a 10-day course. 
None of the teachers or helpers at the centre receive any form of salary or payment for their service. <laughs>